Welcome to the studio on building tomorrow's enterprise. My name is Mark Chillingworth. I'm joined today by Juan Villamil, CTO for the Department of Work and Pensions, Fergus Boyd, a hospitality consultant, Paul Kobe, CIO with Johnson & Matthey, and Oliver Cronk, Chief Architect for EMEA at Tanium. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me uh, in this discussion on building tomorrow's enterprise. Uh, one thing I'd like to talk about is we hear a lot uh, at the moment about startup businesses, born digital organizations. They have a huge advantage. They've just started on a greenfield site in, in, in almost 100% of the cases. You don't have that. You're responsible for large enterprises, established businesses. How, do you, how does an established business, though, build new enterprises, new services, which we're also hearing you must do as business technology leaders when you don't have that inherent advantage? How are you creating a greenfield effectively in what is not a greenfield site? Can I go? Let's start. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have worked in two major enterprises, and British Airways version of Cantic, um, and I'm more of a legacy hotel company, and also two, I'd say, hospitality startups. The hotel is one, and uh, Village, I think, is a good example. Um, I'm sure Paul will come to this too, but in, in British Airways, I think we had a very good idea back in the 1990s, 2000s. We created an internal startup. So basically, we, we gave a group of about 100 people as it scaled up to um, special privileges and special roles, special access to funds, um, protected them and let them exist within a bigger corporate. So the corporate became the mothership and the little startup eventually became BA.com, BA.com. I think it's still the best airline uh, website in the world. I think a lot of other companies then began to realize this is a good, good model to follow. So in my more recent um, original startups, I'd say, um, it has been hard, and it's more about the, the founder's vision and how long they can keep with the, uh, with the program. Um, I think it's easier now because you can spin up servers in Cloud Wonderland uh, and Google or Azure, whereas back in the day you had to buy tin and then ship it in and pay for tin and capital expenses. Yeah. So it's easier to try and fail fast these days. So pros and cons. So, um, I think when I think of... of this problem for, for ourselves. Uh, I actually see as a, as a large enterprise ourselves, I see a lot of advantages that we have. We, we, have, we have lots of data, lots of market insight, uh, lots of experience in serving the crowd that we, that we support. Um, and then we, we also have something that holds us back, which is typically uh, for us is mindset and it's people, it's that capability and how we think about it. So if we bring that into context, uh, how do we then turn that into an advantage and how do we create the agility that a startup will have? And in DWB, we tried a couple of approaches. We, we've tried, uh, as Fergus was, was saying, where we, we started a, um, uh, something we called it Innovation Dojo in, in DWP, which is about bringing divergent thinking uh, into the enterprise uh, and thinking out new ideas and new ways of serving the public. Um, in an unconstrained way, creating that safe space to fail. Um, and that's one of the things we tried. The other thing we tried as well is we took this uh, new code type of approach. So rather than new code, old code, so rather than try to solve everything, because that's always one of the problems we try to solve for everything, we've taken a small problem and said, if we were to do this in an absolutely new way, uh, how would we go about solving for that specific problem? And, and then does that problem, can that problem then scale across the entire enterprise? And how do we use that experience of that small space to win the mind share uh, of the rest of the organization? Because that's the thing that will certainly hold us back. I think, Mark, the, the key thing here is how do you create the conditions? How do you create a, a safe garden where these... Um, a sort of uh, delicate plants can grow and um, the existing enterprise um, doesn't consciously or unconsciously crush them. So um, absolutely, as Fergus said, for BA.com, it was started outside and brought in. For, for JohnLewis.com, we did the same. We found a, um, a, a warehouse that wasn't being uh, used next door to Peter Jones, installed the, 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 the dot .com in there. Uh, but the trick is then to bring it back into the mothership. Mm. And you've got to be prepared for some bumps <laughs> on the way because they've got new ways of working. And the reason you've grown this plant is then to chain the overall enterprise. So, so how do you bring that in and ensure it's sufficiently mature and vigorous 
uh, and got enough drive to actually change the way the overall business works, and, and I think that's the big challenge. In Johnson Massey, we're trying um, a, a different approach, but at its heart, it's about how do you protect these um, you know, experiments. So uh, we, we've got something called the Competency Center for uh, Advanced Analytics, where we try proofs of concept in terms of new business models, um, you know, we're testing out digital twins, um, we're testing out, um, you know, in, in a very defined way how you could apply analytics to one um, uh, production facility. The trick is then, again, as with the BA and JL examples, how do you turn a successful experiment into something that transforms the whole organisation? And, and that's the real challenge. Yeah, bu building on that, the... the the, the danger, I think, with those innovation hubs or those little incubator units is they can become a toy shop very easily, right? So I've worked in a number of organizations where there have been digital teams or innovation units that have been created. And I, I get the points you're making about that they need the right environment to thrive and the corporate immune system will, of course, kick in. Um, but I think there's a, there's a piece around incentivization models as well as um, you know, the organization structure. It's, it's one thing to create these things, but if you don't create the right incentive mechanisms for the organization to get on board, yeah. You, the, the danger is the immune system does kick in, as in if you're rewarding the old behaviours and you want to transform not just your technology but your operating model and want it to be digital, you need to reward those uh, behaviours and, and those ways of working that you want to promote. And this is what I've seen time and time again, is there's lots of investment in shiny technology, but if you're not thinking about how you're incentivizing and, and making the operating model work, these things will just become toy shops, unfortunately. Uh, and I think the answer to that is ensuring that the key people in the business um, actually have a stake in and s support those proofs of concept. So, um, you know, it's not the IT or the digital function having a, a great idea and having like, playing around, heaven Being forbid, with his toys. Yeah. It's, um, you know, we're actually testing this. We, we you know, we, we need to optimize our production at our Macedonia um, uh, AutoCAD facility, and this is really going to do it. And I think the trick with that is to agree with the business some milestones that, you know, if we achieve this, we are then going to get behind this and we're going to roll this out through, the, you know, the, the whole of the world, etc. Yeah, so uh, I think you're, you're absolutely right. So when I think of the challenges that I have in the current organization, it's really uh, in the past, IT could almost be a silo, an operator's yeah. a silo. We were a proxy for the business. We'll take a bunch of requirements and take those to market and, and solve things that way. And of course, the future isn't quite like that. We need to be part of the business. Yes. We need to be with the business as part of this co-creation, ideation process. Yes. And we need to take the experience that we have in technology and the experience that we have in the business, put them together to solve those real problems. And that is an absolute massive challenge. Yeah. You're 100%. If you don't, that's the first thing you need to solve. You can no longer uh, bring those ideas. You can no longer create those new things in that vacuum in isolation of the rest of the business. You've got to solve for working uh, with the business and, and being part uh, of, yeah. of the business. And just to add exactly to that, in, um, in Virgin Atlantic, I had a privilege to run an IT light team. We borrowed from the work I did in British Airways on the poor. And um, we cycle people through. So uh, A, we cycle people, you know, good architects who will come through, good developers, who go back to the business, come into IT light. But in IT light, I created a, a, I call it a suitability filter or matchmaking filters, 20 items. So for instance, today's world, GDPR, we wouldn't touch a project to do GDPR or PII. But back then, you know, we wouldn't be allowed to do such and such a thing. Um, but the business knew that, and they signed off. So the, the chief engineer signed off, or they had a catering, whatever, were aware of the projects that we could do within that constraint. Um, but we sat, I reported to the IT director, so it was part of IT functions. They weren't a shadow IT. We were this kind of fast and furious IT, but within constraints, so we would never touch things that were you know, payment related, PCI related, but things that could bring data to um, you know, flight operations, big screens and mashing data together, it makes sense. And then the idea was, for the better ones, after about a year, they would be migrated and hop across the air gap, as I called it, to the mainstream IT function mm -hmm. and productionize properly with support processes. And a lot of ideas just get killed at that stage because they weren't suitable, they wouldn't scale. So that, that, that sounds quite bimodal to steal a Gartner term. So you have a Is it? Far, I think they borrowed us. Well, maybe, maybe they did, but you effectively have a, 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 a two speed, a, a two speed, yeah, kind of a startup yeah. mentality yeah. unit that then chucks things over. And I and I've seen 
very much sort of smoke and mirrors prototypes get mocked up in, in an innovation unit, yeah. then get thrown over the fence to the production team and they go, what the hell, you know, die, 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 die. is this? It has to be, yeah, has has to be, be has introduced to be. properly. So I think for me, doing this right is you, you, you do this in an iterative manner where it's a minimum viable pro, you know, proposition yeah. that you can then build on rather than something that's like a prototype, like a mock-up business gets excited about it, but then they don't realize what it's actually going to take to deliver it, either in terms of technology or in terms of the underpinnings, right? But I think DevOps has kind of worked on that because yep. basically if you write the code, you're responsible for it forever. So don't write nasty code. Mm. It's got to work. <laughs> yeah. It's got to be real, yeah, as you say. Uh, and, and I think, uh, you know, I, I agree with you, Fergus. I mean, the, the proof that it's working is we've got five projects this year that have been stopped. Um, and we've got four that have gone mainstream. Uh, you know, so if you... you if you can get mm, that balance, yeah. um, it, it's kind of starting to work. One thing I noticed, I mean, here we are, Stones Throw from Borough Market, Shoreditch, this area, awash with really f fascinating uh, young tech firms, also a lot of internal startup organizations, HSBC's digital team is not far from here. Um, but you're, you've all been and you all are with organizations that are spread right across the country, right across the globe. How do you make sure that that, that culture that, that, that permeates to the region so that they don't feel left out so, so that they gain the same advantages. Is anyone working on that? I imagine for, for DWP that's a big issue because you're a big employer right across the UK. So the biggest challenge we have in DWP and often when I'm asked what are your priorities for 2020, I'll describe my, my three top priorities as number one being people, number two being people, and number three being people. <laughs> yes. uh, and it's not really about technology. It's how do we uh, transform, how do we create a vision of the future that everybody buys into and then transform, take the organization with us, build a capability across the organization and encourage them uh, that the future is it's, it's a place we want to create is where they can reach their potential and, and actually enjoy the opportunities that that may bring with them. Uh, and then how do we then attract talent to fill the gaps that we can't upskill and train for? And that is absolutely the biggest challenge, the single biggest massive challenge that, that we have. Everything else will come behind that. If we're able to encourage those good behaviors and our culture transformation, that will, will transform with it. And of course, to, in that context, we also have to look at the, the market and what's out there. So in the space of startups and being near shortage here, I'm always encouraging startups to come and speak to us because they'll know how to solve those problems. They'll have the agility, flexibility, and the wacky ideas, frankly, sometimes that can actually solve real problems for us. The challenge for myself is how do I bring in a startup into my organization without literally killing them in process and governance and all those things? Uh, and, and, and how do I then extract the goodness uh, out of what their, their way of thinking to exploit it across the organization. And so those are the things that we need to work with and, and solve for. And, and that's, for me, that's the biggest challenge. And if I could just say as well, I, th I think the tech these days, is so easy to share and socialize what you're doing. So in my day it was share, nasty SharePoint sites, etc. But now it's Yammer and it's Skype and it's Slack and it's good stuff. So get your products and show them across the company. Um, we didn't do it in, in my previous companies, but others do, which is basically voting. So here are some ideas. What's the popular vote on what we should progress? Um, they end up with voting like vote face occasionally, but it, it's, at least you get some idea from the community what, what's good for them. And they are business people rather than just techie people in the techie bubble. Uh, Fergus, you, you touched on uh, Agile and DevOps earlier. Uh, certainly, you know, I, I've seen in the last five, six years that has become a really pertinent topic. Most organizations, most CIOs and CTOs are adopting it. Um, it increases pace of change, but we've already touched on, uh, on organizational governance and structure. How, as, as business technology leaders, are, are you adopting DevOps, but also baking in governance, you're responsible for people's lives, you're responsible for uh, huge levels of intellectual property and data. The two have to work hand in hand, do they? How are you dealing with this that? Is, this is something that very much was my role at Deloitte. So um, implementing DevOps, but doing it in a secure way and, and, and looking at what you may have heard of as DevSecOps, where you're actually embedding security operations into, into that pipeline. So um, you know, particularly for compliance, uh, you know, why wait until the end of a build cycle to check and test? You know, the whole methodology of Agile is you're iterating and you're checking all the way through. So, you know, there's a, there's a few layers to this. One is the sort of stakeholders. You know, the stakeholders need to be in, understand the, the difference in the way of working, that it's not a, a gated process anymore, or if it is, it's a, a highly iterative gated process. 
Um, but no, it's challenging certainly, but essential to make sure that you can continue to release at speed and, and scale is to have that visibility of what, what, you know, what you have coming down the pipeline and inject at sensible places, you know, automated checks where possible, automated testing, and, and, and build the risk and um, compliance folks into the, the chain, as it were, either their tools or, or their processes built into that, that process was absolutely vital. And I, I agree. I think it's vital that, we, that you recognise that this is a huge mindset change for how people operate, um, absolutely within IT, um, but also in terms of business sponsorship and in, in terms of how the IT operations sort of function works. So it's enormously powerful in terms of speed, involvement and all of those great things. But it's, I think, fundamentally about self-discipline um, and ensuring that the teams understand that um, with this freedom and this speed comes enormous responsibility. So um, a, a, as you've said, a, ensuring that um, you build security in absolutely from the start that uh, you you know it, it's completely opposite of agile if you know you should be testing incrementally as you go through as you finish each sprint and so forth um and you know it has to be freedom within responsibility uh, freedom within a framework um so i think that, that you know the role of the it organization is to set that framework and to uh, and, and to be clear and to build in that self-discipline and if you get it right it's then fabulously powerful you mentioned that earlier didn't you, in terms of you know write good code yeah as part of the process otherwise it, dog isn't down. just for christmas your code isn't just for christmas you know, it'll be there <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you know next year 3000 millennium bug it'll still be there with you know, haunting you your name is still written on it um my well, current companies are too small for the devops sort of thing so we, we tend to leverage a lot of supplier systems so i pick you know apis and good ecosystem try to buy, buy into somebody some base system few of the few of them as possible that kind of can grow with us. And it does unfortunately tend to be the big players that keep acquiring the cool systems that I just owned last year and then being sucked into the, the, the mor morass. Um, but yeah, good APIs these days make it easier. And I think a lot of companies, especially the smaller ones, have to pivot quickly. So as long as the CEO has a good vision for the future and can change, and as long as their architecture is sufficiently flexible, then yes, you can write, one day you can be a HR system, the next day you can be a student uh, training system if you need be, because the code is pretty much similar. So, so sometimes I, I, so I'm in an organization where we're trying to do these things. And sometimes when I speak to my engineering community and, and across the organization, I wish I could ban words like DevOps and Agile. Because <laughs> there, sometimes they're just excuses for not doing certain things that you need to do well, like you were describing. So for me, it's very much about a mindset and how do we change that mindset? And what is it that we're trying to achieve? So effectively, we're trying to uh, deliver much more predictably. We want to deliver incrementally. We want to deliver in smaller chunks. Uh, we want to deliver products that, that will cost us less to maintain, support, all of those things through the life cycle. And it's about enabling that culture change, that mindset change, because the business also needs to participate in that process. So it's not just about technology. So for me, if I don't have the business engaged in saying, we're going to go to market with, um, you know, a minimum viable product. I tend to call them minimum lovable products because mm -hmm. that's, that, that's a much better, uh, I think personally, I think it's a much better uh, definition of those products. And then we're going to incrementally take features and deploy new features as the market tells us we need them, right? And we can adjust and adapt to those needs. Uh, that's a massive mind shift change mm -hmm. because for the previous generations, the business would specify the product to the nth degree they will then send it over the fence to, to the IT organization. IT will then send it and farm it off to some supplier. Uh, we would always be late. It would always be over yeah, budget yeah, and, and all of those things. And that's the relationship and the norm that existed for generations. And so you now need to win the trust. You need to educate and take the organization along with yourself. And for me, that's the first challenge. So stop fixating on solving that problem fixate on creating those new ways of working and get those communication channels right. And when somebody in Agile tells you, oh, I don't need to do documentation, well, that's not quite right, or I don't need to do, or I can fix forward and do those things, well, no, that's, that's not quite right. And then there's lots of methods, tools, processes that you can adapt to, to do a good job at that from that technology perspective. But
and it feels like some of those old cultures of the big projects and all that are still being bred out of, of, of businesses. It's, it's uh, you know, I think you need to look at, going back to your original question, how do larger organisations take the best of smaller startups? Well, they have to make do with a much smaller workforce. They automate a massive amount. They use cloud. They, you know, they, they, they automate and they, they have visibility uh, because they're, they're much smaller. It allows them to be more agile. And I, th I think the, the key thing to about APIs is how do you use these things in a smart way that, that you know, automates and unfortunately some of these things aren't popular with some people because they've built up a way of working that's very manual and you, you, again it's, it's sort of breaking down some of those you know, some of those cultural and process challenges and people challenges to say look there is a, a far more efficient way of doing this but it's taking people on that journey and you know, APIs for me in every organisation I've worked in have very much been a you know, APIs and automation have very much been the journey to take people on. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. I was going to say is 100 percent because you have to create the enablement from a technology perspective that's going to allow you to create the speed and agility at the product side of, of things. So in the past, we built full stack products, all integrated, these great monoliths. And of course, you don't want to do that. You want to create agility at the front end in, uh, as to how your customers are, are going to be experiencing you. So enabling that platform mindset of saying here are the enablers or the accelerators, as I tend to call them in, in DWP. I'm saying APIs, absolutely. If you're going to do anything, APIs. If you're going to um, bring identity as a common way of doing things rather than reinventing the whole thing, data as an enabler as well. And, and it's being able, doing that basic housekeeping first, it's critical. Otherwise, you start a whole bunch of random things um, and, and then you end up in a bigger mess than you were in the first place. I mean, I've, I've got both ends of the spectrum on this. So, you know, we've got legacy ERP systems and systems that, uh, you know, run, um, you know, production. And um, those have to be managed in a legacy traditional sort of way. And you need to do that properly and, 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 and test and, uh, and, and do that and be clear about that. Uh, however, where we're developing new stuff using Agile and the delight um, of our business colleagues, you know, when they realize they can pull their customers in, when they can change things on. Um, it, it's great to see it again. And I've seen it in uh, sort of various situations in different businesses. You know, that the understanding that, you know, you don't have to spend five million and, and, and wait for two years before you get the answer is just fantastic. And you mentioned that complexity of, of, of you know, having uh, effectively for want of a better word, two-speed businesses and what have you. How, how does uh, having a, an awareness for you as CIOs and CTOs, almost being like the ship's captain and having a dashboard uh, that gives you real-time awareness of everything that's going on in the organization, that all the different technologies, legacy and modern, all the different governance rules, how, how is that? Is that coming into the business? Do you have that dashboard? Are you beginning to see that clarity so that when the CEO rings you up and says, I've got a, an EPOS system in Perth down, uh, you can say, it's okay, we're on it. And actually it's, uh, you know, it's, it's an SLA that is- So uh, proactive rather than reactive, right? Yes, having, yes. having that visibility. No. Well, we, we actually built that in um, sort of John Lewis, you know, particularly around <laughs> topically Black Friday. Um, so um, we could see um, uh, exactly what we were selling. Um, and, and the volume. So um, we used to sit around um, at midnight before, uh, and also when uh, we went live on Christmas Eve for the, uh, uh, the sort of uh, Christmas sales, um, you, you, you know, you could see the, 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 the numbers absolutely drop. And so we built um, this rather sort of clever thing, map of the UK, and um, you know, e each time the dragon got sold, or each time uh, you know whatever it was, <laughs> you know that year, or, or any any product, um, the image from the website were there, and you know when it was flicking very very fast, you could see it, uh, and you could see the conversion rates, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. We could see all the EPOS uh, in all the stores, um, and so on and so forth, um, and also we had the social media. Uh, sort of scans going as well. So that sort of control room is um, something that uh, we built. And, and for something that is as real time as, uh, you know, Black Friday, um, that, that's extremely helpful. And uh, um, we, we used to have two versions of it, actually. Sort of, uh, there, there was the public one um, where the uh, managing director and all the directors and marketing folks 
turned up and looked at, and then there was our one, <laughs> where we were running the operation for. Where some of the gremlins were living, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they were the same. <laughs> and, and just to build that story, uh, yes, and, and in Village, I think the, the MD and the CTO have a great vision, just basically to bring data together, like one of their questions, you know, data lake, but, and, and there are you know, half a dozen or a dozen um, dashboards, but the most important dashboard is a dashboard that monitors other dashboards. It tells you, don't trust the food and beverage dashboard yet, because Choosy's data is missing or something, and those are kind of key to the business success. So that was one of the first problems we had to solve in, in DWP. So when I joined five years ago, uh, IT was very much a black box, mm -hmm. and it didn't perform particularly well with everything being outsourced. So the journey was uh, relatively straightforward. You could describe it as taking back ownership and control uh, of our infrastructure and our services, and the next part would be how do we drive stability? We were having 16 major incidents every month. It was an absolute leaky bucket uh, of performance and service. And of course, in, in many senses, in many ways, more than one way, uh, it was a, it was greenfield for us because the, the, the infrastructure wasn't instrumented. There was no tools there. But of course, uh, as we took back ownership and control, we couldn't address how do we fix this big monster and, and how do we start to bring uh, world-class service into the organization and the way to do that was to instrument uh, the infrastructure as we were building the new infrastructure and we end up with yes we have a lot of legacy and, and, and infrastructure that we still maintain and support in the traditional way you were describing but also we have the new uh, in the new products and services that we're building where we can start thinking of operations as code and instrumenting right from the onset as you're building the application. And that inside, that rich inside, we, we've built a user experience center, we call it, a, a knock in the old days where we have 24-7 operations. And that insight comes, um, it, 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 it's critical for, for me to be able to make decisions. That's where we're going to focus. That's the thing that we need to fix first. And that's what's going to give us the stability and the performance we need to actually do in IT, what we say on the team, mm -hmm. you know, just mm -hmm. do the basics, just make it run, make it run predictably. And the net result right now is that we have amazing performance, uh, touch wood, and hopefully I'm not jinxing <laughs> it here. We haven't had a major incident uh, in a very, very long time. We've just gone through the Christmas period. Uh, we've, we've hit all our Christmas payments to some of the most uh, vulnerable people in society. And that's been thankful because of all of the instrumentation mm. and insight that we've been able now to gain. And it's now core to what we do. When we think of a new product and service, we think of how do we instrument it, how do we get that insight. Uh, and if it's using the new methods, DevOps, Agile, and all of those things, how do we let those teams write those um, operations as, as code. So we've deployed what we call the S an SRE model uh, where um, they effectively own it, as Fergus was describing before, you build it, you own it kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. And how do we also work through maybe our payment systems mm -hmm. are still very traditional mm -hmm. and, and clearly you want them to work. And so that insight has been critical for us and, and we now depend on a, a lot of the decisions we make for the future on that information. It's invaluable for us. Oliver. So it's, it's, it's interesting for me hearing the different points of view. It's great to hear that people have, have some of this data, but my experience at places I've worked and customers that I talk to, a lot of folks don't even know how many computers they've got, you know, <laughs> connect to their network or what yes. networks they have. That's or, where we you know, were. Yes. What applications. Yeah. So it's great to hear that that's an evolving story for you. I mean, that's, that's very much where, where we operate is, is, is help, helping in, in, that, in that space. And I think it's been quite game changing for large organizations we work with for them to get that real time mm -hmm. visibility of what they have. And then not only that, but then respond. So if there is a, a, a malicious, you know, cyber, if there's a cyber attack or some malicious incident occurs, you know exactly, you can go and find the, inf the infrastructure that's affected or you can actually provide a status report and then go and actually do something about it. I mean, it's, it's staggering quite how many organizations are, there are out there with massive investments in IT, but they're like a couple of broken shoes. They haven't invested in the, as you say, the inf instrumentation and the other pieces to actually know what they've got and know that BAU is running smoothly. So it's, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting topic for me. And the only other piece I'd say is, um, and what Paul alluded to, is, uh, is social media. So I think you know, the ultimate dashboard on your business are, are your customers. Because um, if something's down, people will tweet about it or Facebook you or message you. Um, when the BA website is down, as it has been a few times, unfortunately, um, you tend to find out it's on Twitter first of all, then you get a message saying, sorry, it'd be back in XXX. Um, so I think that that is the uncapped view of the world. So, and I, 
products like Hootsuite and, and various other um, will monitor that and add it to your operational data. And it tends to be a few hours in advance of you knowing something's gone wrong. And it's free as well. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's a brilliant point because we do live in a world where everything is real time, mm -hmm. don't we, now? And, and, and yeah. as, as Fergus alluded to, everyone here, your organizations would suffer if, if, if there was an issue and, and for those reasons. And presumably you have to be aware of that. Yeah, so um, on, during Black Friday, um, there's a website that's monitoring all the retail websites, uh, whether they're up or down, um, you know, from volume or, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, absolutely, the pressure is very real. Yeah, yeah. So bring it back into the organisation a bit more then. That's, how is that changing the role of the technology team? It sounds like the, the, it is developing into becoming the workshop of ideas to, to create... Uh, new business issues to create, look at ways to solve business problems. Is that happening or is that still some way to go? Um, you know, in, innovation's a much overused word at the moment, but, uh, <laughs> but, but are you finding you're in a, you and your teams are in a better place to, to help drive different ways of, of running the organization? So, personally, I think it's happening and we have a long way to go. Um, and I think we're starting to realize as an organization that if we're really going to take advantage of the, the opportunities that the future will bring for us, uh, we need to sit at the same table as, as the business. So there's no longer IT or technology and there's a business unit. We, we, we have to sit together. And that's where uh, things like design thinking, co-creation and, and all of those approaches come into play as well. We are part of that organization. We, we need to be tied at the hip with them. And, and, and that is one of the biggest challenges we have now as we continue our journey. Um, and um, it is one of the areas of, of focus where we're trying very, very hard, but we're finding it very difficult. We're making little steps. Um, and, and that's really important that you're always making little steps. So we're not trying to solve for everything here. We're trying to solve for little steps that we see progress that we can then use to take the rest of the business along with us. I think uh, I will say, you know, the, we have said there are no IT projects or any business projects, but I, I, I think, Mark, you're right, that actually the role of the CIO, CTO, CDO, um, you know, whatever hybrid um, we are, um, actually is more central. Um, and there is much more focus and understanding um, amongst executives and non-executives. So uh, I'm on a board, non-exec on a board of uh, a bank and financial services is, uh, you know, clearly, um, g you know, going through um, business sort of transformation, uh, rise of digital challenges. You could look across all sectors and, 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 and you'll find that. So um, I, I, I think um, I, I, my, my personal feeling is that, that there's more pull um, uh, sort of in the past, you know, I, I've been lucky to work with visionary leaders who really, really got it. I, I think these days, um, you know, almost every company has on its agenda, you know, you know, what is our digital strategy? How can startups, you know, steal our breakfast uh, and lunch? You know, what is our defence? You know, people are asking, you know, you know, data. Okay, I've heard it's a new oil. What on earth does that mean? Um, and so I think our job is to unpack that. Uh, and I think we, we have a critical role in talking to our colleagues about, um, you know, what all of this really means. Um, you know, what is, what are the real opportunities for um, our, you know, our existing business with the advantages we have of in our case, 202 years, but actually how is digital technology going to change us? I um, mean, you know, how do we develop new services from our old products um, and, and so forth? So uh, I, I, I think, um, you know, it, it's sort of uh, more challenging, but uh, it's a kind of more challenging in a good way because I think that opens more doors for us. Yeah, so when I think of the, the, the challenges going forward, and I think I'd always bring it down to my context, which is probably a little bit different to a retail or, or organizations yeah. such as BA or uh, John Lewis. Um, we, we have two challenges as we think delivering our strategy, two things that we're focused on. One is around customer service. It's really, really important for us. How do we improve customer service? And the other challenge we have is how do we uh, do that from a position of greater efficiency? That's the ambition that I guess applies to all of us. 
And uh, of course, traditionally, we'll have the business trying to work and solve that problem there in the business silo, and we'll have IT in the IT silo working out how do we uh, take some cost out of running the infrastructure or maintaining the infrastructure. None of those things are going to shift the dial. If you really want to shift the dial, you need to come together in one team because the way you've done things in the past isn't how you're going to do them in the future, and you need to reimagine and that future, and you need to work out how technology can support you through that journey. Um, and that's the, the challenge that we face uh, across the department. And, and sort of building on that, sorry, uh, uh, what, we've, what I, I found was that um, each part of a business, so um, w we're about um, sort of applying science in, in, in different areas in innovative ways, whether it's sort of uh, catalysts or components of drugs or new battery materials. So they're very, very diverse areas. But everybody was um, starting to experiment, try digital things. Um, and uh, so several people were looking at digital twins, or several people were looking at uh, uh, applying AI um, you know, to, to production lines. So um, what we did was get um, people from across the business together and say, look, we need to run, we, we, we need to work out um, and understand what a digital twin will mean for us, what the opportunities are. Um, you know, we need to really um, think hard about how we can apply advanced analytics. Let's decide across the business where we're going to have a real go at this. Um, and, you know, we, we'll pump prime these. And on behalf of the rest of us, you in clean air, Macedonia, you try that analytics um, and, and bring that back to us and so on and so forth. So th th that, that's worked really well because um, I, I think everybody's seen the value of that and the learnings um, and the ability to uh, sort, of, sort of share. And it's stopped us dissipating um, the, 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 the effort because you know, we, we've got lots of vendors trying to sell us all the answers to this. You know, it, it really focuses it. And actually, it's better for the vendors that they're actually dealing with coherent and if it works then we can roll it out to a company. Mm. And, and do you find uh, that your your technology teams have, are in a better place now that they are they are approached and come to for ideas to, 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 to spawn you know developments uh, I'm sure shadow IT still exists but uh, um, but but your, your technologists are trusted partners that, that they are seen as part of the, the, the way to build a new idea. Uh, just to, to build on, I think the, the IT skill sets are changing. There are still people who want to be a project manager forever, or a business analyst forever, or a developer. But I think the, the newest breed of people are, you know, it's an old expression, the T-shaped people or pie-shaped people, sort of more, a um, couple of good skills, but actually pretty generic across others. So they're, they're good at talking and understanding business concepts. And they, they were born digital, so they kind of know how to run apps, etc. Um, but they can challenge and bring in ideas. But they've still got one or two or three good solid mindset that they can develop on and maybe chop and change and maybe stay in your company two years and naturally cycle on, have a portfolio career rather than 20 years in one company. So I think that will force change by definition. And uh, you know, we have more demand than we, we could afford or indeed the, 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 the organization could manage in terms of overall change. So I, I, actually, I, I mean, I, I guess in some ways it's a quality problem, but I think it's really important to uh, you know, focus, uh, you know, investment on the things that will really make a difference. I think we've all said, you know, um, no IT projects, only business projects. So what's really going to move the dial? And I, I, I think, I, I see my role as orchestrating a, 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 a lot of that and very much working with the business in terms of, you know, what's going to pay back. Um, you know, where where's the, the the real benefits? And what I try and do is, um, you know, produce. IT strategy paper for the exec and the board, which uh, enables them to take informed decisions. It's not IT's role to place those investments, but I think it is definitely our role to, you know, ha have a view um, and to, if if you like, and shape um, a, a really quality discussion about where is the best place to go with these. And we talked a lot about kind of business and IT working more closely together. I'm seeing a trend for more business-led 
you know, digital transformation. Yes. Where, you know, as CIOs and, and technology leaders, we're still expected to be responsible for all the infrastructure and all the technology that exists in our organization, yet we're not always sponsoring or involved in some of the projects. So one of the things that's really quite interesting for me at the moment is how do you discover those teams or those technologies like digital twins or perhaps someone yep. that's working on a distributed ledger project or uh, so, someone else is working on Internet of Things, how do you discover those things? How do you get visibility of those things when they're not actually being kicked off by the IT organizations? That, that for me, is a really in, interesting problem that, 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 we're, that we're looking at. That role of the CIO, CTO as the broker in many ways. Yeah, but, 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 but also being able to kind of get, get visibility and see what's going on in the organization from a project perspective or from a runtime run perspective. When those projects are perhaps spun up in the cloud or someone's built, built some machine learning model, you know, but who's checked that for risks or you know, who's checked it for bias or whatever? Ultimately, someone's going to come and breathing down my neck for that, but I didn't spin it up. So how do I get visibility of those things happening? Yes, and, and for us, how do you do that with, uh, with the least friction without yep. really having more governance or more governance? That's the challenge that, yep. that we have. So for me, one of the biggest challenges we have across the organization is that how do we prioritize? How do we know that in a specific project is actually adding any value at all? Because as you can imagine, we've got a lot of projects across mm -hmm. the enterprise um, and we don't want to be delivering projects anymore. What we want to be doing is creating products and services. And so how do we create uh, the forums, the mechanics to actually see through those products and say, actually, that's things you're doing that's absolutely zero value to the rest of the organization, we can actually deprioritize that and focus the resources on the things that will really add the value. And that's what we're struggling with a little bit. It's not easy to, to change uh, that mindset, but it, it, if you recognize it as a first instance, then you can actually start to do something yeah. about it. So, I mean, this is one of the, um, the, the, the challenges of having um, better informed uh, colleagues and customers, isn't it? You know, so the chief marketing officer is going to know all about um, social media and yeah. uh, you know uh, digital there. And, and in fact, what, what one of my previous colleagues said, uh, Paul, you know, you, you, our jobs are very similar. Um, the only difference is you guys have bad haircuts and we have very smart ones. But um, <laughs> which I think he meant in a very nice way. But the um, uh, so so I I, I think. You, it's, it's the tension we've all got to manage, isn't it? Between, on the one hand, we're responsible for you know the security of the organisation for its cost base, mm -hmm. and those things. Um, at the other hand, we, you know we want to allow the right amount of innovation. So, mm -hmm. I, I, I think you've got to balance that control, and and they, they, you know there are some red lines you, you've got to have. I mean, it might be useful, but in my third or second previous company in the hotel, I was. Because there were only 10 people in the company when I joined, I was VP IT and VP Digital. So basically, I was an IT director with sales targets. So I would say to IT people, take a stint in the business and realize what it's like you know, to, have a, to be responsible for delivering that revenue rather than just selecting great products and delivering them because that's the sharp end. If you don't do that, you go out of business quickly. And that's where you really get to see this is, this is why these decisions are being made to close down this and open certain, certain countries. Um, it's hardcore business decisions. And the IT stuff is great, but if the business isn't working, you're not aligned to that, then you're all wasting your time. Well, and vice versa, I guess. And vice versa, you know, yeah. The more, yeah. And, uh, I wish we could get more you know, movement between this thing called so called business thing, you know, and, and IT. Actually, the business is becoming very techni technically enabled Absolutely. and therefore needs to have visibility of yeah. the constraints or the opportunities yeah. that, that, that the, the organization has. The realities, absolutely. And, and that's a brilliant point. Do you believe then, you know, as we see cross functional teams, as we see uh, marketing directors have their own IT operations, finance directors have their own operations? Do you see that, that transparency, that dashboard view that we touched on earlier in the conversation? becoming actually very democratic and everyone in the organization can see the technology performance and, and, and how things are going. How, how would you feel about so that? So keeping everyone honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I think with big data and dashboards, there's no, there's no hiding. The data is there. Now that, that is the certified qualified view of, of revenue today, yesterday, VOI, etc. And you can dig into that to find out which, which people, which companies, which systems didn't deliver. So there's no hiding it at all. Yeah. We all have to raise our game together. But, but I, I think one of the things we're looking at is citizen data scientists. So, um, you know, because we can get the data into a data lake, uh, you know, we can use the tools of any of the, you know, the usual suspects in terms of whichever cloud um, you're in. Um, but, you know, for me, it's absolutely imperative that um, my, my 
smart and technology enabled marketing or science colleagues can't muck up the data, uh, let alone export it where it shouldn't go. So, you know, you, you, you've you got to ha have those controls. And I think it's, um, you know, a, a sort of essential that, uh, you know, it, it, it's that freedom within the framework. Um, and, um, you know, a modern enterprise uh, that's operating in the GDPR uh, sort of uh, world is operating in a financial service regulatory world um you know you just have to have those controls they are not optional so you've got to explain why and then allow it within those limits yeah so that you one of the challenges for us is how do we create transparency across the business to, to your point and how do we do that in a safe secure way where we comply with all of the requirements that we have whether it's gdpr or any other regulation that we have to meet, and, and, and that's what we're there to do, to, to manage those healthy tensions. Um, but that's no excuse for not being transparent. And I think now uh, we, we, we have to be very transparent uh, with technology. So is the architecture that as a technology leader you develop and the governance that you put in place, which has had quite a traditional way of being done for 15, 20 years, is that no? Is, is it harsh to say that's no longer fit for purpose? Uh, and is there a new way of, of creating architecture and a new forms of governance that you're looking at that embraces DevOps but understands your your legacy and, and, and all of those things that we, we've discussed in this debate? I, I think so. So, so, I, so I have an interesting perspective on this one, but having 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 recently joined Tanium, mm. and the, and the reason that we're we've been very successful in very large organisations is we have completely reimagine the architecture when it comes to our particular challenge. So most uh, software vendors ha continue to use a client server model. Um, you know, we, we're, we're using more of a distributed computing path pattern. So you know, to manage larger IT estates, generally you'd need, you know, in some cases, thousands of servers just managing com other computers, which just seems like an inefficient waste of resources. And actually, what we've, we've, you know, we spent the first three, four years of our company's existence back in uh, 2007 onwards just reimagining how we do this and so coming up with this linear chain architecture. So fundamentally rethinking the architecture. And I think this is happening in, in, in all industries, not just from the technology standpoint, but if you think about the operating model as an extension of your architecture, your business architecture, you know, you look, you look, you know it's a bit cliche, but you look at the Ubers and you look at the Airbnbs and the others that are rethinking how their business is architected in terms of capabilities as well as technology. I think this is happening all over the place. Sure, there's some legacy technology that maybe are your systems of record that you wouldn't want to touch. But I think, you know, there are absolutely opportunities to rethink and, and the ones that do will be the ones that will get a, a, a leg up and an advantage over the competitors that, that aren't thinking that way. I was just going to, to add so traditional architecture in, in, in the past, if you had a problem to solve or, or a problem to, to build, you would think of it in that full stack context, you'll draw all the lines between all of the boxes and you'll talk so it or whatever, you know, words that you probably wouldn't understand. And the way archi the architecture of the future is very different. It happens in much smaller domains. So, uh, and what I try to do is to create guide rails for those domains. So if you're at the front end building a proprietary service, your guide rails are very simple, give you all of the freedom you need as long as you're in, in those guide rails. Mm -hmm. um, so promoting reuse, use of APIs, the use of data mm -hmm. in a certain way, security integration into the enterprise in a particular way. And, and if you're able uh, to do that, then uh, go to town, just build as much agility and as much um, speed and flexibility as you can in your product and, and service. And that's very different to the traditional architect that will think of that whole solution end to end. In fact, we don't want that anymore. If we do that, we just, uh, we again, we're taking steps back uh, in terms of how we do things. So trying to democratize architecture. That's very difficult for the architects hmm. and for security and for, for everyone across the organization. So we have to bring everybody along on that journey uh, as well for us. In my hospitality world, we don't get quite the same um, ability to change. So it has been dominated by large players who kind of have these things called PMSs, which are basically ERP, but they're designed to be closed. So everything is in there from your crew rostering to your check-in, check-out, and they don't talk and they don't share data and they've been locked in for decades. But the newer players are basically API first, mm -hmm. and they're not hotel management systems, they're asset management systems. So you could turn that room into a meeting room or turn that into a car parking space, it's the same systems. 
So I think for me it's about flexibility um, and it's about picking the right partners who can kind of grow with you at the same shared vision because otherwise it doesn't matter what your architects want to do if the suppliers can't deliver it. Yeah, you're wasting your time. I think I, I'm maybe slightly more on the, the sort of training end of the, 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 the spectrum um, in terms of I think one of the, the things we've been really keen to do is ensure that we have real clarity about um, you know, IT policies, controls and standards and those are um, promulgated and they are real so uh, and, and maybe that, 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 that's a structure that, that your colleagues are talking about here uh, and actually I, I don't want um, a sort of innovation and uh, agility happening everywhere. Um, I mean, the organisation can't manage that amount of change. Um, and, you know, as I said before, we want to make some choices about where we go. I, I think w then picking on the areas where we do want to really accelerate and really change. So uh, I, I, what we're trying to do is sort of target, um, you know, developing new services and new products in terms of, of where we're going and, um, you know, how we run plants are sort of two of our sort of focus areas where we're, you know, trying to manage um, that, that kind of change in the ways that we've talked about. But for the rest, I, I think, um, be, you know, consciously being, um, you know, appropriately locked down and just allowing changes, um, you know, I I in the right way is, is, is important. Gentlemen, thank you for a fantastic debate. I've, I've got this vision of, of, of the enterprise becoming like a bobsleigh run, uh, where you've got these teams in the bobsleigh <laughs> hurtling towards change, working together as a team, but con contained within the safety, the guide rails, if you will, yeah, that's one, of, of the run. <laughs> yeah. um, and, uh, and, 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 and <laughs> Suitability filter. Absolutely. Um, thank you for a fantastic debate and sharing your insights from, from, from your more varied organisations and experiences. It's been a, a joy to host. Thank you for joining us. My name is Mark Chillingworth. This is The Studio. Thank you.